starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Strangers. All right, this is my list. So I'm starting off with my favorite horror movie of all time. This movie, directed by Brian Bertino, starring Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman, is truly an incredible blend of cinema, suspense, a bit of gore, and it's the sort of real life factors of this one that just really get me. The movie is basically set in a remote sort of cabin area, and a couple is there for the night after an evening out and a bit of a relationship blowout. The pair suddenly finds themselves in the house that they're in, surrounded by strangers in masks who are wanting to play a deadly game. The movie is terrifying, it really is so good, and the ending isn't disappointing, which is always a nice treat. Like I mentioned, it's the reality of this one that really is terrifying. Serial killers are a very real thing, and it's a thing that is a lot more tangible than ghosts and demons. This spooky season, The Strangers, has to be on your must-watch list. In our number 9 spot today, we have The Shining. One of the most famous horror movies of all time, this film, based off of the Stephen King novel of the same name, was directed by Stanley Kubrick and stars Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall. This movie is so famous for a reason. Jack Nicholson plays the central character, an aspiring writer who accepts a job as the off-season caretaker of the famous Overlook Hotel. He, his wife, and son head to the isolated hotel, but after a winter storm leaves the family stuck there, Jack's sanity slowly slips further and further away due to some potentially supernatural influences that reside in the hotel. It is horrifying, it's a classic, and it is a huge part of the horror genre. In our number 8 spot today, we have As Above, So Below. This movie is one absolute ride. Directed by John Eric Dowdle, this film stars Perdita Weeks as an archaeologist who is dedicated to finding the Philosopher's Stone. No, this is not a Harry Potter crossover. This stone is a real life artifact and is rumored to grant eternal life as well as to turn any metal into gold. The search for the stone leads her and a crew into the Paris catacombs, and as they document their journey to find this hidden artifact, they begin to uncover the secrets that lie below the city streets. It really is a terrifying, kind of disorienting movie. It's very good, it's very scary, and it's very suspenseful. In our number 7 spot today, we have Creep. Okay, there's a couple Creep movies, but today I'm talking about the 2014 found footage style psychological horror film. This movie was directed by Patrick Bryce and was also written by him along with Mark Duplass, and the two were also the stars of the film. This film is one of the strangest I have ever watched, but I had to put it on this list because it left me with the most eerie, uncomfortable feeling I have ever had in my life. There's just something about this one that really stuck with me, and I don't think I'm the only one. Basically, Patrick Bryce plays a videographer who ends up finding a job where he has to record the very eccentric character that Mark Duplass is playing. The pair said they were inspired to create this movie by other classics, like My Dinner with Andre, Misery, and Fatal Attraction. It is said that they changed a lot about this movie as they filmed, which left there being multiple versions of each scene, along with several alternate endings, but I have to say the ending they went with was definitely the best, most skin-crawling choice. I haven't seen the other options, but I just know that based on what I did see. There was a sequel to this film that was released in 2017 that I haven't dared to watch yet, and a third is said to also be in the works. In our number 6 spot today, we have The Watcher. We've got to give some love to a new 2022 horror, and based on the newest horror movies I've seen, if it's gonna be any movie, I'm gonna give it up for The Watcher. Directed by Chloe Okuno, this movie is about a woman who moves with her husband to Bucharest, and she quickly starts to suspect that a stranger from the building across the street might just be watching her. This is one of those movies that makes you question everything you know. There's suspense, there's twists, there's turns. It's generally just a really great movie. Micah Monroe, who plays the main character, does a really great job, and all in all, I would say that this is a really good watch for this October spooky season that we're in right now. In our number 5 spot today, we have Hereditary. All right. I'm not gonna lie to you, you're all my friends. When I saw this movie, I was not in love with it, but whether you love this movie or hate it, I think we can all agree that there's at least a jarring scene or two that we wish we could erase from our memory. Hereditary is a psychological thriller that was written and directed by Ari Aster, and it stars Tony Collette, Alex Wolf, Millie Shapiro, and Gabriel Byrne, who all play a family that is being sort of haunted by a mysterious presence. This all begins after a death in the family, the death of their really secretive grandmother. 
After her passing, truly all hell breaks loose. Many people consider this movie to be one of the best of all time, praising both the direction as well as the performance of the actors. There's eerie vibes, there's shocking moments, and the ending is wild. It's definitely a movie to watch if you haven't seen it yet. In our number 4 spot today, we have The Conjuring. We have to include this movie today, if for any reason, because it is the one that inspired an entire franchise. The Conjuring universe is based on cases of paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, but this first movie is based on the story of the Peron family, who started to experience paranormal happenings in their family home. This supernatural horror was directed by James Wan, and it stars Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga as the investigators. If paranormal movies are your thing, The Conjuring definitely is a great one. The first film in the franchise received quite a bit of praise from critics who enjoyed not only the performances, but the direction, the writing, the entire atmosphere of the movie, and also the score. It really adds some incredibly creepy elements to the film as well. If you're going to watch only one Conjuring movie, I'd say that this is the one to watch. In our number 3 spot today, we have The Poltergeist. Released in 1982, this movie is an absolute classic. As Biography.com put it, quote, When you mix a daughter who communicates with spirits living inside a TV set, a backyard that becomes a swimming pool of muddy skeletons, a wolf beast demon that lives in a closet, and Steven Spielberg's genius, you get the perfect formula for blockbuster scariness. That couldn't be more true, but what's even scarier than this movie is the story of the curse that the movie left behind. Most of the stories of this curse are fueled by the deaths of multiple cast members who all passed away either during or shortly after the filming. To make matters even more mysterious, two of these deaths were completely shocking and totally unexpected. Some people believe that because Spielberg insisted on using actual human skeletons rather than props as a way to save money, he might be responsible for bringing the curse on set. All in all, this movie is a classic with a chilling tale to go hand in hand with. It. In our number 2 spot today, we have The Human Centipede 2. Yeah, we're skipping over one and going right into two, but to be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter which one. You need to pray to someone before watching these movies. I mean, what in the absolute world? In the first one, we see a deranged German surgeon who creates this human centipede using people he kidnapped, but the second one sees a deranged lunatic who is inspired by the first film to create the same sort of thing. That's some human centipede inception kind of stuff that I am absolutely not on board with. There are rumors surrounding the inspiration of these films because it's a pretty fair question. How did somebody come up with such an idea? Well, no one is exactly sure. The inspirations are just as grim as the film and range from coming up with a horrific punishment for some of the worst kinds of criminals, all the way to being inspired by some of the atrocities seen at Auschwitz. Whatever the true inspiration for these movies really was, they are sufficiently horrifying, if for any reason, just the sheer plot alone. In our number one spot today, we have The Exorcist. This movie is another absolutely classic horror film, but it is on this list for an entirely different reason. The 1973 supernatural horror was directed by William Fredkin, and right from its release this film was controversial. There were some pretty adverse physical reactions from some audiences, and I mean if you've seen it, there's a few scenes in it that would be pretty jarring for an audience in the 70s, but despite some of the outcry surrounding it, this remains one of the highest grossing R rated horror films of all time, and this movie has quite an influence on pop culture. I want to specifically talk about one cast member though, a small role, the radiographer. Yeah, you must remember the scene. I mean, there's tons of blood, and it's been praised by medical professionals for its realism, but the radiographer, who was a real life radiographer and was not an actor, actually went on to become a real life killer after the release of this movie. In 1979, Paul Bateson was convicted for the killing of film industry journalist Addison Verrill, for which he was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. In 2003, he was released on parole, which he completed after five years. Here's where things get even darker, though. This has never been proven, but there are beliefs that Paul is actually responsible for a series of unsolved killings of gay men in Manhattan. Apparently while in jail, he boasted about having committed these crimes, but unfortunately no evidence has been concretely found to connect him to these crimes. In the end, while The Exorcist is a terrifying movie that really set the stage for supernatural horror, the real life story behind it is also the stuff of nightmares. Let's jump into our top 10 with The Ring. 
Now there are lots of scary things in this movie, both the Japanese and American versions. Seeing that demon girl standing in front of that well is enough to send shivers down anyone's spine, but for most people, the scariest thing in this movie is the sight of her climbing out of the TV. Who can forget that scene? Now most of us watch horror movies safe in the knowledge that the terrifying things happening are behind a TV screen and they can't hurt us, it's fine. Then you watch The Ring and it's like, wait. Hold on a second, these scary things are now climbing into the real world, that's terrifying. You will definitely need a friend to remind you that the demon girl might be able to climb out of the movie TV, but she won't be able to climb out of your TV. Probably. I'm just saying probably. You may also need your friend around after the movie. After I saw this for the first time, I did not trust TV static for months. I still don't really. Alright, moving on now, we have a movie that I haven't personally seen, but when I told people I was making this video, they said, I just have to put it in. At number 9, it's The Babadook. Now fans of this movie point out that The Babadook is one of the most unsettling movies in recent years. It's all about a woman and her son being mentally tortured by an evil entity known as The Babadook, a monster from one of the boys storybooks. It's a slow building thriller with a lot of heightened tension and suspense, with the mother slowly descending into absolute madness. Now it would be easier to watch it and carry on like normal if it wasn't for one thing about the Baba Duke. He only haunts those that become aware of him. So the mother was totally fine and safe until she heard about him. And I was totally fine until I heard about him. And you guys watching this were totally fine until. Just make sure you watch this with your friend and uh, good luck. Coming in at number 8 now, we have The Blair Witch Project, one of my personal all time favourite horror movies. Now when this came out back in 1999, it was called one of the most original horror movies of all time. At the beginning of the movie, we are told that what we are about to watch is actual footage from three student filmmakers before they went missing in the woods. <sighs> And from that moment onwards, it doesn't feel like a horror movie anymore, it feels like horror real life. The production of this movie was actually less than $30,000, that's very cheap for a movie, and to be honest, it does look kind of cheap in some parts, but that's also what makes it so scary. You have to actually remind yourself you're not watching real footage, unless it was real the whole time. That's a scary thought. Either way, especially in this day and age of everyone filming every single trip they go on, this movie is easier to watch when you're not totally alone. Just don't do it in the woods. Next up at number 7, we have Dawn of the Dead. Now this movie came out in 1978 and has remained one of the most iconic zombie movies ever since. For that reason, it kind of represents the movie version of a question that a lot of people ask themselves at some point in their lives. What would I do if the world as we know it came to an end in a zombie apocalypse. Just like Stefan and Francine in the movie, your plan will probably involve having someone else with you. Nobody ever pictures themselves just taking on the zombie hordes that you see in Dawn of the Dead by themselves. That would be very difficult. You want someone next to you to have your back and you want them to preferably not be a zombie. This movie, just like an actual zombie apocalypse, you can probably get through it by yourself, but it's a lot easier if you have a friend with you. And now guys, we have a movie that might have given an American state and a gardening tool a bit of a bad name forever, and number 6 is The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This 1974 American movie followed Sally and her friends as they try to get away from the twisted serial killer known as Leatherface, the guy who wears people's faces on his face. Nice. It cuts pretty close to the bone with how real parts of it feel. You don't feel like you're watching some Hollywood actors and actresses who are covered in thick makeup and blood, who have someone fanning them in between takes. These characters in this movie look a real sweaty, dirty, exhausted mess. Uh, to be honest, they look like sh And you would, you totally would if you were trying to run from a crazy man with a chainsaw who has been chopping up everyone you know. It also feels real because it's not about some supernatural zombie or demon which you can easily put to the back of your mind as not real. This movie is about a human, just like me or you, doing horrible things with a chainsaw and that's not so easy to dismiss. Now eventually in the movie, Sally does manage to escape, but only with the help of a kind stranger. So just in case Leatherface does show up at your home while you're watching this movie, it might be best to have someone with you. 
Next up at number 5, we have what some people are calling the greatest horror movie of all time. It's The Shining. Now, if you think of scary stuff from horror movies people watch these days, there's a good chance The Shining did it first and The Shining did it better. Jack Nicholson plays, quite helpfully, a character called Jack, a father who descends into madness as his family are tormented by an empty hotel's dark secrets. Sometimes you're not sure if what you're seeing is the hotel or if it's Jack going insane, but either way, this movie took psychological horror to a whole new level upon its release back in 1980. Just like a real slip into madness, when you're watching The Shining, you're really not sure what to believe and what is real. People in general, just like Jack, go absolutely insane if they can't figure out where reality stops and imagination begins. And as the viewer, we're dragged right along with him and it leaves us with a sort of hollow and vaguely unsettling feeling at the end. It's definitely nice to have someone next to you for when that feeling comes. Personally, I'd want to watch it with Jack Nicholson himself, but uh, he never returns my calls anymore. Shame. Moving on to our number four now, we have the Japanese American cult classic, The Grudge. Now, this movie is all about angry and sad ghosts who take out their unfinished business on an American nurse who has come to work in Tokyo. It covers a lot of what you want from a movie like this creepy kid. Check. Long haired creepy woman? Check. And enough jump scares to kill a horse. It made millions of people scared to wash their own hair in case a hand crawled out from their own skull. But perhaps what scares people the most when they watch this is that the grudge isn't a grudge against the person who deserves it, the person who killed the ghost before they died, you know. It's a grudge against some innocent, totally random stranger who actually just wants to help. So nobody is safe, not even you. In case the grudge ends up in your home, you might want a few friends next to you to help you take out that creepy kid. Usually it takes about five grown adults to stop one scary ghost kid. Just saying. Alright, next up we have a movie that you might know better by the name of its main character, and number three is Child's Play, featuring Chucky. Chucky is a voodoo doll imbued with the spirit of a serial killer. That's all you really need to know about this movie. Before this movie came out, kids were scared of scary toys. After though, every toy was a suspect. Chucky continues where the serial killer left off and starts bumping people off in gruesome ways as he tries to possess six year old Andy. But it's not just six year olds that have dolls that are scared by this. But the thing is, it's not just six year olds with dolls that are scared by this because as you watch this, you realise that pretty much every house out there has some sort of scary doll in it. It might be a doll that's being played with by your younger brother or sister, or maybe it's an old one that used to belong to one of your parents and now it's sitting in the attic. But either way, seeing a serial killer doll like Chucky run around slaughtering people will make you trust nothing, absolutely nothing, except the person you're watching this movie with. You're definitely going to need two of you when you go upstairs to face that doll. Next up now we have a movie that I watched twice when I was a teenager and I will probably never watch again. It's etched into my memory and it won't go away. And number two is The Exorcist. It came out in 1973, but most horror movies simply haven't been able to beat it. It's a movie about a normal person in a normal bedroom in a normal house that gets possessed by an evil demon. And most people who watch this movie for the first time are a normal person in a normal bedroom in a normal house. And it really does help to have someone next to you to remind you that it's probably not going to happen to you. It's honestly one of the most terrifying horror movies of all time, set in one of the most familiar, relatable settings I can even think of. I can't stop thinking of that scene, you know, where she twists her head the whole way round. Actually terrifying. I am scared right now. If you haven't seen The Exorcist, then firstly, don't. Just don't do it, turn around and walk away. But if you really, really want to, make sure you watch it with a good friend, especially one that isn't possessed by a demon. And finally, we have the 1984 classic that has made millions of children all over the world afraid to fall asleep. And number one is Nightmare on Elm Street. Just like some of the other movies on our list, Nightmare on Elm Street is terrifying because it strikes at two things that most of us can relate to living in a neighborhood and dreaming when we fall asleep. So when serial killer Freddy Krueger brings terror to both of those for the kids on Elm Street, it's going to leave you a little bit shaken up. Having a friend to watch this movie with will help for the scary parts, especially when you see Freddy's face. I hate those bits, but it will also mean that you can pause the movie to get a snack or maybe go to the bathroom without being absolutely terrified of seeing Freddy standing out there in the street. But even having a friend can only help you so much with this movie because the truth is, if I'm honest, you can hide from Freddy as long as you want and surround yourself with all your your friends, but eventually 
Eventually your eyelids will start to feel heavy, your head will start to drop, and you will fall asleep. And that's where Freddy will be waiting for you. And none of your friends can help you then. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, didn't mean to be that scary. Sorry, guys. Well, I actually scared myself a little bit. Seems like a good place to wrap things up, don't you guys think? Starting off at the top, we have A Quiet Place. A Quiet Place came to theaters in 2018 and had audiences shocked with this new concept and for their use of sign language. In fact, I saw this in theaters and the movie was so quiet that I felt too intimidated to eat my popcorn. This movie surrounds a world that has been taken over by alien type creatures. The only way to survive is to stay super quiet as these creatures detect people by sound. Now, in the opening scene of the movie, most of us probably missed this hidden clever detail. As the family goes into the store to load up on food and medicine, you can see shelves covered with bags of unopened chips. Well, that's because chips would be too loud to eat. The crunching noise would most definitely attract these creatures. I definitely would not survive living among these creatures because I love chips. What's your favorite flavor? Comment down below. Mine is ketchup chips. Those are a Canadian delicacy. In our ninth spot, we have Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth is a 2006 fantasy thriller Spanish film directed by Guillermo del Toro. This movie surrounds Ophelia, a young innocent girl whose life begins to evolve into a fairy tale world when she discovers a labyrinth. However, this labyrinth is filled with some creepy creatures. The scene I will be discussing is the one where Ophelia encounters the creature with eyes for hands. It walks around like this. Imagine that I had eyes there. Yeah. Now this scene first takes place in a long, deep red colored hallway which leads into a wide dining hall. The walls of the hallway are deep reddish brown in color and appear wet, giving the illusion to that of blood. The blood color along with the rough textured walls parallel the appearance of the inside of a throat. This emphasizes the danger of the place and the fact that it is home to a pale man who eats children. In addition, the paintings of the pale man eating and killing children along with the dusty pile of children's shoes foreshadow her face. Yet she still didn't get the hint. Furthermore, the fireplace screen is the shape of a mouth with sharp teeth. This also parallels this creature's mouth. Honestly, the set design was really well done for this whole movie in my opinion. Coming in at number 8, we have Insidious. Insidious Chapter 1 was actually one of the first scary movies that I fell in love with. I thought that they genuinely had some good pop up scares, and the series is well done. Now, before I dive further into these series, let me do a quick little story time. So, the first time that I watched Insidious, I was over at my friend's house, and we were both watching the opening scene, which people often made fun of because it was like three minutes long. It's super long. Well, during this scene, the TV froze and went black. And then when I got up to go and try and check on it and to fix it, the screen came back on and it was this scary woman's face holding a candle and I scream and I jump back and I have no clue why her face was on the screen that close. It zoomed in. It scared me. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, maybe, maybe her house is haunted. Who knows? Anyways, in this movie, there are several times when you can see the ghosts before they actually appear properly on the screen. In Insidious Chapter 1, you can see a ghost boy facing backwards with his head against the wall, blending in with their coats before he is seen in the next scene dancing. This dude is apparently the master of hide and seek because he was just there in plain sight. The same thing goes for Insidious Chapter 2, when the mother is walking down the house on the phone, she passes by her living room and the ghost can be seen chilling at her desk. When you spot these ghosts in the scene, it just adds another layer of creepiness, knowing that the ghosts can come in and go as they please and are constantly lurking around the family. At number 7, we have The Conjuring. Now, I'm also a fan of The Conjuring series. For those of you who don't know, these movies are based off of true life events and real ghostly encounters, which makes the story that more terrifying. Now, The Conjuring 2 is about a demon taking the form as a nun and tormenting the lives of a family. In order to get rid of this demon, they have to learn its name and banish it back to hell. Now, it takes them a long time to figure out this demon's name. However, if you notice in several scenes, its name, Valak, appears in the background. It can be seen in the kitchen, on the bookshelf, on a windowsill, and even their daughter is making a bracelet that spells out his name. Now, how they didn't see that surprises me. But then again, when I first watched the movie, I never noticed those things too. So, uh, I'll be lenient on that one. At number six, we have Psycho. This 1960 Alfred Hitchcock movie surrounds Norman Bates and his mother, Norma Bates. Yes, her name is Norma, and she named her son Norman. 
How original. Now, from this movie, several remixes have been made, including the Netflix series Bates Motel. One of my favorites, actually. In fact, Rihanna actually appears in a couple of the Netflix episodes as Marion Crane, who is one of the main characters in this film. This movie surrounds Norman, who basically is so infatuated with his mother that he ends up embodying her and killing multiple people. It's much more complicated like that, but that's just kind of the gist of it. In this film, there is a really creepy visual that may appear as just a weird transition to the next scene. So what I'm talking about is during a scene when Norman Bates is in the police station, there's a moment of stillness where he just looks directly directly at the camera and smiles before it transitions into the next scene. But in that transition, it's Norman's face merged with his mother's dead corpse, who he murdered. It's quite creepy. I don't know who came up with that. It's oof. In our fifth spot, we have Final Destination. Ugh this movie. I watched it as a kid and it made me so paranoid. Like I couldn't look at household objects the same. I was too afraid that a fridge would fall on me or something after watching these movies. Well, Final Destination is known for being very uh, out there and extremely gory with crazy situations that realistically wouldn't happen in real life. Now, in a lot of these movies, they often foreshadow the character's death. In fact, that's kind of what the franchise is known for doing. There are way too many to count, but here are some of these examples that you may not have picked up on while hiding under the covers. It's okay, I do it too. In Final Destination 2, Evan is seen cooking a meal for himself. He's a terrible cook, by the way, like there was no hand washing and he just missed the pan pouring oil, like who does that? But that's not the point. On the fridge beside him, the magnets spell out hey, H-E-Y-E. -E. As things start to go wrong in his kitchen, the H falls off the fridge, leaving the magnets to spell out I. This is foreshadowing Evan's death, which was a result of getting a ladder impaled in his eye. Now, the next ones are a little more cryptic. In Final Destination 5, two of the characters are seen outside of a building called Presage. Presage means a sign or warning that something bad will happen. How fitting. After that, a construction caution sign with an image of a bridge has a small tear, so it looks like the bridge has collapsed, in which it eventually does. And lastly, while one of the characters is at gymnastics, you can see a power cord that resembles a skull face, foreshadowing that her death is near. In this scene, as she is prepping for her routine, her elastic band snaps. This in fact was a foreshadow to her death of a snapped spine. In our fourth spot, we have Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs is a great movie about a shy little lamb who's afraid to talk to his other lamb friends. Just kidding. Silence of the Lambs is a 1991 mystery horror starring Jodie Foster as a young FBI trainee Clarice and Anthony Hopkins as Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a cannibal, murderer, and psychiatrist. This movie is a mind bender on its own, however, there was one key scene that passed right over some of the viewers' heads. In a scene between Clarice and Hannibal, he states the famous line, a census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and some nice Chianti. Now, to some, this may sound like just another disturbing line in the film, when in fact, it had a much darker meaning. Now, back in 1988, when this book was originally written, psychiatric patients were often put on monoamine oxidized inhibitors. While taking these inhibitors, they weren't allowed to eat certain foods or else it would result in their death. Three of the most deadly foods they couldn't eat were liver, fava beans, and red wine. Yet Hannibal Lecter didn't die. So in this scene, he was in fact telling Clarice that he was off his medication, which then leads him to escape and kill a bunch of people. Lastly, another quick little detail that you may not have noticed is that the actual cover art for this film seems to be just a picture of a death head's hawk moth. These moths naturally have a skull looking shape on their body, however, if you look close enough, this skull is actually made of two female bodies, symbolizing how Hannibal would go after women, murder them, and then wear their skin. Coming in at number three, we have It. The remake of the 1990 Stephen King horror movie was proven to be a big success, becoming the highest grossing R-rated horror movie worldwide. Now, this movie is known for the creepy looking clown Pennywise that pops up numerous times throughout the movie to scare the viewers. Basically, Pennywise terrorizes this town every 27 years or so, attacking the children and feeding off of their fears. Now, throughout this movie, Pennywise makes many subtle appearances that you may not have noticed at first glance. One of his first appearances is when one of the kids, Billy, heads down to his basement 
basement. Pennywise's yellow glowing eyes can be seen watching him by the stairs before emerging from the water. Pennywise made his next appearance while another one of the kids, Ben, was in the library. He is first seen possessing the body of the librarian and she just creepily stands there watching Ben in the background. It truly is terrifying. Now, as Ben continues his research, he also comes across some history on the town and on an Easter egg hunt massacre that took the lives of numerous children. Although you may not be able to see it until paused, Pennywise actually appears in this photo, making it seem like all of those children were killed by him. We also have him appear on the brick wall mural behind the kids in another scene. It's literally like, where's Waldo? Where's Pennywise? Lastly, in this movie, there is an eerie scene when the television show that is playing changes to the host and children repeatedly saying, kill him, kill him, and then kill them all. If you notice, the children that appear on the show are actually all of Pennywise's victims, including Georgie and the bully that was murdered in the sewers. Next up, in our second spot, we have the 2018 thriller, Hereditary. Man. Where do I begin with this movie? This movie is just too much for me to handle. Like I actually felt physically sick while watching it. So on that cheery note, let's discuss it. This movie is about a family who is apparently tied to a cult by their bloodline. The cult was run by the children's grandmother, whose end goal was to summon the demon of hell, Payman. <sighs> Jeez, I feel like I need to start like saging this room or something as I'm talking about it. So in order to do this, the demon needs to inhabit a boy's body from this bloodline. This boy is played by Alex Wolf. So I know, do you guys remember him and his brother Nat Wolf from the Nickelodeon show, The Naked Brothers Band? Cause I do, man, good times. Anyways, so now that we sort of understand the story's concept, let's discuss some things you may not have noticed. In one of the exterior establishing shots of the house, if you zoom in close enough, you can actually see that the house is surrounded by cult members. Terrifying. In another scene, there is a party happening and you can see some of the teens watching a movie. This movie is playing a scene that shows someone getting decapitated, which is a common theme throughout this movie. From his sister cutting off a crow's head, to her getting her own head decapitated, to his mom slicing her head off in front of him, to the ending scene where there are decapitated bodies bowing down to the demon. This is just a huge symbol throughout the movie and man, I almost lost my head watching this movie. One last detail in this movie surrounds the symbol on the grandmother's neck. Now this is the real symbol of payment and it can be seen all throughout the film, even on the telephone pole that the sister gets decapitated by. This symbol along with other dark words like Satany and Zaza can be seen engraved in the walls of the house if you look for them closely. Ugh, I'm just getting the chills talking about this, I need to stop. And in our number one spot is Shutter Island. The 2010 film Shutter Island directed by Martin Scorsese is a psychological thriller starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Teddy Daniels, a US Marshal. Teddy alongside his partner Chuck Aiol, played by the Hulk, Mark Ruffalo, are sent to Shutter Island to investigate the disappearance of a missing patient from a mental institution of the criminally insane. Now this film is filled with symbolism, like the constant use of the colors blue and red symbolizing water and blood. Now, what does that have to do with this movie? Well, spoiler, towards the end of the film, we find out that Teddy is a patient on Shutter Island, in fact, the most dangerous patient. The water used throughout the film represents the lake that Teddy's kids drowned in, while the dark red color symbolizes blood from when he shot his wife. Water is definitely a symbol of the truth of his past. In the opening scene when Teddy and Chuck are on the boat to the island, Teddy tells Chuck that he feels sick because of the water. This is a metaphor that he feels sick because he can't handle the truth of what happened to his family. Furthermore, in the movie, there is a scene where Teddy is interrogating patients and one patient asks for a glass of water, yet when she is drinking it, no glass appears to be visible. Let me show you the scene. This symbolizes how Teddy is trying to block out water as much as he can since it reminds him of his past. Now another detail that you may have noticed in this film is a particular statue that is constantly shown in shots when they are in Dr. Colley's office. In particular, in the scene where Teddy suffers from a bad migraine, which is actually just his withdrawal from medication, the lightning flashes and illuminates a statue. This statue is of the Greek god Pan where the word panic is derived from. This statue emphasizes how Teddy is starting to realize that there is something off about the asylum and how he is slowly starting to panic and slip more into insanity. Now, the biggest detail in this movie that when I discovered this, I literally yelled Eureka, well, not actually, but like figuratively, 
Like, I was so proud of myself. And this has to do with the posters that are seen in Mr. Cawley's office. Hanging on the walls in his office are photos of a person getting a lobotomy done and a person hunched over in a cave. Additionally, when Dr. Cawley mentioned these photos, he says those paintings are quite accurate. This points out that those photos are foreshadowing upcoming events. When comparing these photos to the scene later on, when Teddy imagines that he sees Dr. Sheehan in the cave, it appears as if the painting is an exact representation of the scene. Coincidence? I think not. This highlights that Teddy has had this hallucination of the doctor in the cave before, and that Dr. Kali is aware of this, and so he frames them on his wall in his office as a way to trigger Teddy to remember his past. With regards to the lobotomy photo, well, it is said at the end of the movie, since Teddy just relapsed into his old persona, he went to go get a transorbital lobotomy, done to erase his past permanently. 